It is now time for a question period. The member from Thornhill. Thank you, Speaker. And good morning, everyone. Uh, my question is for the Premier. You're not an elected Premier. You hold office because about a thousand, because about a thousand Liberal partisans voted for you. But you use that office to hold Ontarians hostage by buying union peace with one-off deals. Now, order, please. Order. I, uh, I actually hear it coming from both sides, so we could bring it down, please, so the question could be put. Member. Recently, the LCBO and Opsu's Liquor Board Employee Division reached an accord averting a strike right before the May long weekend. The LCBO had empty shelves and lineups out the door while racking up sales the top $28 million that day. The whole thing was a scare tactic, Speaker, used to boost revenues and manipulate your government because OPSU knows your track record. OPSU's ratification vote is set for June 3rd, but a copy of the collective agreement's highlights is posted on their website. It says the four-year deal includes a so-called wage freeze, Premier, but Premier, it's smoke and mirrors because there are signing bonuses of $9 million. Oh, now, Premier, how can you call it a wage freeze you. while handing out not well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I would just say that in terms of my uh, status as an elected member and as the uh, Premier, uh, the people of Don Valley West certainly did elect me, Mr. Speaker, and it seems to me that there was a convention and that the party elected me. So, Mr. Speaker, I hold this position with pride and uh, am doing everything in my power to work for the people of Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, on the uh, on the issues of the agreement with the employees at the uh, LCBO, I, I, I'm not going to speak to the specifics. I understand that the ratification vote is going to happen, Mr. Speaker. But we have worked very hard to make sure that uh, all of the settlements fall within the parameters that we uh, outlined, Mr. Speaker, and that is wage constraint. And my understanding is that the agreement fell within those parameters, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. You refuse to admit, Premier, that you're in over your head and that you've lost control while Ontarians continue to pay for this nonsense. Premier, the one thing I believe that you are consistent about is deflection. So I say, enough is enough. You and your government have been caving to union demands on the backs of Ontario taxpayers for the last nine and a half years. Here's what you said in this House on March the 4th, and I'm quoting. We've been very clear that constraining public sector wages is part of what we're doing and will continue to do. That's why we're on target. The Drummond Report said that if we didn't take those measures, if we didn't work to constrain costs, then we would not be able to balance the budget. Accurate quote, Premier, and accurate answer. Premier, you are neither constraining costs nor on target to balance the budget. We both know that. Why don't taxpayers know Question. about the full cost of your backroom union deals? Will the McGuinty win Liberals make these deals public today? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I just, I just have to, I just have to um, counter what the member opposite said in terms of our uh, being on track to balance the budget. We've overachieved on our deficit reduction targets every single year, Mr. Speaker. So we are on track to uh, eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. And with regard to public sector wages, Mr. Speaker, let me just talk about some negotiated agreements which are in the public realm um, with the English Catholic teachers and AFO, the French uh, French teachers, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, we, uh, we realized a total savings of $2 billion over three years, Mr. Speaker. Amapsio, 10,000 public service employees, Mr. Speaker, 1,000 uh, hours of bargaining. Uh, the savings there, Mr. Speaker, $24.6 million in 12-13, $30.4 million savings in the year 13-14, Mr. Speaker. The OMA, the Ontario Medical Association, 25,000 doctors, net savings Thank of you. almost $400 million over two years. We are constraining wages, Thank Mr. You, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're on. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you. Premier, how can you stand here in the people's house and disregard facts and even your own words? You've always put union bosses and partisan interests ahead of taxpayers. With over 50 percent of the Ontario budget going to government workers' salaries, you cannot achieve restraint without an across-the-board wage freeze, as I proposed in Bill 5, which has passed second reading. According to OPSU's website, your most recent deal also includes general wage increases for 2015 and 16 at roughly 2 
2 per cent per year, and in case of privatization or closure of an establishment, part-time part -time employees would now receive $2,000 for employee transition, which is up from $1,000 under the previous agreement. Who but you could call this a wage freeze? The unions know what's in the agreements. The Liberals know what's in the agreements. Why don't the people of Question. Ontario? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I'm going to speak to the nub of this question, which I think is really uh, do you want to work with organized labour or not, Mr. Speaker? Do you believe that working with people who are, co are collectively bargaining is a good idea or not, Mr. Speaker? We think it's a good idea. We think it's a good idea zero, to honour the collective years. bargaining process, Mr. Speaker, to work with, uh, with employees of government, to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we set very clear parameters Order. and that we work within those parameters, but that we do work in that collective bargaining process in good faith, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that the Durham, member opposite does not agree with that position. The member opposite would undermine labour in the province, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite does not believe, as I, uh, if I can say from their behaviour, does not. They do not believe in working with with employees who Answer. are in collective bargaining situations, Mr. Speaker. We do, and that's the work that we've been doing. New question, the member from Thornhill. Working with doesn't mean caving in. So back to the Premier. Ontarians are left shaking their heads. Ontarians expect transparency and accountability from elected officials. They aren't getting that from you or from your cronies. You put union bosses Order. and Liberal Party interests ahead Tennis of taxpayers, and because you cannot control any of this, an arbitrator has raised hospital costs by awarding SEIU a 4 per cent increase over two years while you stand here and say that you're reining in spending. Your Liberal government has created a new elite workforce in the public sector, complete with gold-plated pensions, greater job security, higher wages than the rest Minister of the Minister of Rural Affairs, come to order. to pay for those salaries and will never, never receive such luxurious benefits. Your only balancing act is to say one thing and do another, Question. Premier. So how are you going to balance the budget when you keep spending beyond our means? Premier. Minister of Finance. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I find it very curious from the member opposite who's talking about wage restraint. And yet, when we were there to try to resolve issues with the doctors, to resolve issues with teachers, to resolve issues with regards to uh, uh, generic drugs, you stood idle. And we had to take some tough decisions. We moved forward on moving that bar to control our spending. And as a result, our spending is below 1% year over year growth. And when it comes to these wages and the, the dealings that we've had with LCBO, I'm very proud of the negotiations that our teams did to create a wage freeze over the next two years. And what matters here, Mr. Speaker, are results. And the results are we are having a zero zero wage freeze over the next two years. And, Mr. Speaker, we're, crea we're creating cooperation and yes, collaboration sir. with all stakeholders because a collective agreement and negotiated agreement is the right way to go, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. You guys take a tough decision. I'll eat my hat. Look, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. This morning alone, this morning alone, you've attempted to pull the wool over Ontarians' eyes twice. You cannot sugarcoat the facts. With over 50 percent of the budget going to government workers' salaries, this is a serious issue that your government has demonstrated that it does not know how to handle. Instead, Ontarians keep learning about wasted tax dollars through the lack of transparency and accountability evident in eHealth, in Orange, more recently diluted cancer treatments. Premier, Finance Minister, how many times do we have to ask, how are you going to balance the budget when you keep spending like drunken sailors just to keep up with your unions? Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the Tea Party thrives over there. They're looking to bust unions at all costs. What we need, Mr. Speaker, is a collaborative effort. We need to work closely for the benefit of taxpayers. And that's what's resulting in our budget, and that is what has occurred over the last couple of years. Even arbitrated deals are coming in at zero zero. So, Mr. Speaker, we will continue. We will continue to work with all partners. We'll continue to respect the collective agreements, and we'll continue to work towards the benefit of the province in the end, because ultimately that's what we want. What we don't need to, and quite uh, I, respectfully, we don't need to have 
continuing fights on constitutional debates and issues that will polarize us even further. We need to cooperate. We need to work for the benefit of all of Ontario, Answer. and we'll work with you for that matter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. If the Tea Party's thriving over here, I've got to say socialism's thriving over there. You hold constantly, hold on, hold on. you constantly kowtow to the unions. You just caved in to multiple NDP demands that'll cost a billion dollars plus annually. Finance Minister, your track record speaks for itself. You only know how to put party politics ahead of taxpayers' interest, and you're wrapped around far too many fingers. It's that simple. The cost of doing business in backroom deals with the Liberal Party at the expense of taxpayers has been detrimental to Ontario's economy. With all of these backroom deals, now Ontario is facing the highest debt in history, and the finance minister knows it. Ontario taxpayers cannot continue to foot the bill for your party's political games and for your pandering. When will you and your party finally admit that you're in over your heads and you don't actually have a way out? Here, here, here. Mr. So, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> I am very proud to say that our track record does speak for itself. That is why we have $5 billion lower deficit than we originally projected. That's why next year our projected deficit is another billion dollars down. And we will continue. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we will continue. We will continue to be disciplined. We will continue to, to constrain our spending as necessary. We have made every effort to maintain it below 1% year over year, and that has been proven by our track record. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, even our negotiated settlements within the envelope that we've identified has also been met. So it would be nice, Mr. Speaker, if the official opposition would also work in a minority government, as is a third party, for the benefit of the people of Ontario. Yes, this budget reflects the entire scope of Ontario's issues. It's for the people of Ontario. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premiers now received the report from Metrolinx calling for higher taxes and an increase in the gasoline tax. Is the Liberal government planning to proceed with these plans, Speaker? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we all knew, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the Metrolinx report was going to be coming out. I want to thank the, the Metrolinx folks, the boards, for their work putting together this report. Um, we are committed, Mr. Speaker, to finding real solutions. I know, Mr. Speaker, that the, the congestion situation in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area cannot be allowed to continue. And so it is absolutely critical that we have a dedicated re revenue stream. The Metrolinx investment strategy, Mr. Speaker, is one part of that conversation that is happening. There are other there are other possibilities, Mr. Speaker, but we will be taking we'll be taking the Metrolinx report under advisement and we'll be engaging with the people of the Member province from Durham about how we make sure Second we have time. a dedicated revenue stream, particularly in the Greater Toronto Answer. Hamilton region, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Speaker, the premiers argued that in difficult times, people have to make sacrifices and may have to pay more to get Ontario moving. Can the premier tell us how much the Liberal government has spent cutting taxes for the corporate sector over the last five years or so? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me just let me just um, stay on the the transit issue for a, a moment, Mr. Speaker, because I know that the third I know that the leader of the third party is concerned about how this process will roll out, and she knows that we have been clear that the legislature will have a say as we make a final decision on those on those revenue tools, Mr. Speaker, because it is extremely important that we have a debate outside of this house and within this house about the future of infrastructure, particularly transit infrastructure in the next 20 years in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area. Because, Mr. Speaker, the state of transit and the, the um, reducing of reduction of con congestion in this region is paramount in terms of the possibilities for economic growth for the region, but for the province, Mr. Speaker. It's paramount in terms of improving people's quality yes, of life. Sir. That's why it's so important that we get this right. There will be an opportunity for the legislature to have a say on this, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, you know, one calculation, in fact, several calculations, put the amount of uh, money that the, this government has given to corporations and in cuts into the billions God since bless. they became government. And the government insists that as soon as the books are balanced, they plan to cut corporate taxes even more here in the province of Ontario. 
The Liberals use the word fair in the budget, Speaker. Does the Premier think it's fair to ask people to pay more out of household budgets while the Liberal government tells Ontario's largest corporations that they're due for yet another break? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So here's what I think is fair. I think what is fair is to be honest with the people of Ontario oh, yeah. about the complexity of our situation, Mr. Speaker, to recognize that government has to do more than one thing at a time, that government has to create the conditions for business to be able to thrive, Mr. Speaker, so that those businesses can create jobs. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, government has to understand that people are spending too much time on the road trying to get to work, trying to get to their kids and bring them home from school or take them to daycare, Mr. Speaker, and that those, those Thank you. Carry on, finish. Those issues and challenges coexist, Mr. Speaker, and so we have to deal with all of that at the same time. So we have work to Answer. try to put conditions in place so that business can thrive, and at the same time, we need to deal with congestion in the GTHA, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Here the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is to the Premier. The day before the budget, the government wrote to Ottawa asking them to delay a plan to open new corporate tax loopholes. This new loophole will allow Ontario's largest corporations to get the HST off of their expenses. Expenses like gasoline, Speaker. Has the Premier received a response yet? Mm. Finance. Mr. Finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, as a member uh, opposite knows, I, I presume it's not a tax loophole. It's not something new. It's not a tax break. It is part of a negotiated agreement that we made when we did the HST and we made the transformation. It applies not only to uh, entertainment and, and meals. It applies to equipment purchases, automobiles, and a number of other equipments, telecommunications, and so forth. And it expires over a period of time. We've now asked the, uh, the, the federal government to allow that expiration to continue so that we also can to benefit from uh, those revenues. But it is something that we have to do in cooperation with the federal government, as do other provinces that have negotiated the same thing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's usually a duck, and it's a tax loophole, and it's a tax break. That's exactly what it is. The government signed an agreement. The minister's right. He signed an agreement that said that Ontario's largest corporations don't have to pay HST on expenses like gasoline. And that new tax loophole is going to open very shortly. Jim Flaherty is making it clear that he's going to hold the government to their agreement that they signed. The government's public estimates, the government's public estimates, peg this new loophole at a cost of $1.3 billion a year. Does the Premier think it's fair, Speaker, to ask families who are already paying the new HST on gasoline to now pay an additional fee every time they have to fill up, while Ontario's largest corporations get a tax roll a tax break when Question. they roll up to the pumps. Minister of Finance. So I know the minister Excuse me. Excuse me. Minister of Finance has to pass it back if that's going to happen. Minister of Finance. Oh, no. <laughs> but Mr. Speaker, over to the Premier. No, 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 Premier. No, 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 Question. Sorry. So we agree. I've made it clear that we're bringing it forward to the to the federal minister. We've asked for this to be reviewed. We recognize the the concerns raised by the third party. We've uh, we've had this discussion and we're continuing to do so. Uh, I should clarify, though, the number brought forward is not to that extent because if you're dealing with just meals and entertainment, it's much less. Uh, it's around two to three or. It doesn't matter what it is. What's mattering is that we want to consider doing the extension. But it's not $1.3 billion as bring brought forward by the uh, opposite. Thank you. Member opposite. Supplementary. We don't count loopholes. Speaker, it matters to Ontarians. Yeah. It matters to Ontarians, I have to say. New Democrats have been very clear. Ontarians deserve transportation infrastructure and transit that is accessible and gets people where they need to go when they need to be there. But we've also been clear that we will need a fair and balanced way to pay for it. This Premier put the word fair in the name of her budget. Talk is easy. Action is tougher, Speaker. The Liberal government is handing tax breaks worth billions of dollars to Ontario's wealthiest, wealthiest corporations from while Chatham families come to order. who have already been whacked with an unfair HST are being told that they have to pony up yet again. 
Does the Premier really think that that's fair, Speaker? So, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, uh, the exemption continues. That hasn't uh, expired as yet. We're trying to negotiate and work with the federal government to extend it. So that's the discussions that we're having. But we have taken other measures, Mr. Speaker, in order to be balanced and fair. We've taken a number of measures to invest in our young people, to invest in health care and education, and we're continuing to do what's necessary to support those most vulnerable by not penalizing them when they go to work. What we want to do is be fair to all Ontarians. We also want to stimulate growth. We want to ensure businesses are investing in Ontario, and we will continue to do that as well, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you. New question. The member from Nipissing. Very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week at the uh, Justice Committee, we saw more damning documents as your uh, hand-picked finance minister has testified. Finance ministry estimates from last February show the Liberals were setting aside $900 million for the Mississauga and Oakville power plant cancellations. The documents prove it was well known within the Liberal government that the cancellation costs would be higher than the $40 million and $190 million that you claim. Absolutely. Premier, you were at the Cabinet table when cancellations were discussed, and you knew the costs would be higher. Will you admit today the exact date when you knew the Oakville cancellation was higher than the $40 million you Question. continue to claim? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have answered these questions at committee, Mr. Speaker. The OPA provided varying costs, Mr. Speaker. They cost change. The complexity in uh, changing OPA estimates, I think, Mr. Speaker, justifies my asking the Auditor General to look at both situations, Mr. Speaker. I've been very clear that we wanted to open up this process and make it possible for all of these questions to be asked, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is there was no firm number, Mr. Speaker. No one had access to that to a specific number. The number Numbers changed, the estimates changed, and I answered that at the committee, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Yes, the questions are being asked, but we're still not getting the answers. Uh, at committee, we saw that the Liberal strategy of ditching, diverting, and destroying documents continues. It's alive and well, Speaker. The same $900 million document had a key piece of information missing. It was missing the critical footnote that explained the $900 million risk. Oh, we found it in another document, uh, Speaker. We found it in another version. That's how we knew it existed. Obviously, somebody forgot to white out all of the uh, documents, Speaker. It's the same old tricks from the same old Liberal government, Speaker. Then again, every other Liberal who has come before the Justice Committee has failed to be forthright. I'll ask you again, Premier, will you pledge today to return to the Justice Committee Question. and tell us when you knew the Oakville cancellation? cost was more than $40 million. Mr. Speaker, this is absolutely outrageous. The honourable member is standing up and saying that we redacted a document that he had, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, the footnote... The member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. I, I may just jump right to a warning if he wants to continue. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, the committee requested all drafts of a document. They received various drafts of the document. He had many copies of the same document, Mr. Speaker. The footnote he's referring to was in the document that we gave to him, Mr. Speaker. And the fact of the matter is that what it was was a cost estimate, a worst case scenario from a finance official months and months before negotiations Answer. were wrapped up. The real question, Mr. Speaker, is why would the Leader of the Opposition not tell us his estimates when he you made the exact same commitment. You. Supplementary. The supplementary, sorry. New question, the member from Timmins James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. At committee, uh, later, at the committee last week, uh, we had a document that indicated that, in fact, when it came to the Oakville gas plant, that Trans Canada Credit, a uh, Trans Canada Pipeline, I should say, was in force majeure, which meant to say that you could have cancelled that gas plant without costing a nickel to the taxpayers of Ontario if you would have only taken your time and done what your ministry officials were encouraging you to do. Why didn't you do that? And why instead?
said did you choose to do something that cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars? Wow. Premier. Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important that we go through the situation here. The City of Oakville had been trying to block the uh, had been trying to block the uh, the creation of this gas plant, Mr. Speaker. But we knew that Trans Canada was going to fight any attempts to block it, and that it was much better for us to sit down and negotiate. I'd remind Mr. Speaker of the testimony of Chris Breen of Trans Canada Energy, who had this to say to the uh, committee: We were already before two different courts with what looks like about four actions, and we were before the OMB, the Ontario Municipal Board, with two appeals. We had a contractual obligation. It was very cleanly spelled out in black and white that that was our responsibility. You have to go through every possible channel to deliver on your obligations in this contract, and we would have done yes, that. Sir. Mr. Speaker, we took the prudent course in negotiating with TCE in order to find an agreement on this issue. Thank you. Supplementary. You're right. The, town, the municipality of Oakville was not giving the permits necessary to allow that project to go forward, and they were in force majeure. What you, all you had to do to save taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars is to, in fact, not do what you ended up doing in regards to this negotiation. So it seems to me, and it seems to most people, what you did is what Liberals are really good at. You took the interests of the Liberal Party first instead yeah. of taking the interests of the people of Ontario. So I ask you again. Why would you choose an option that cost us hundreds of millions of dollars when you could have got out of this a heck of a lot cheaper if not having to spend anything at all? Thank you, Governor Hussey. Mr. Speaker, I know that the honourable member would never want to leave the impression with this House that if those bylaws had been overturned, and I just produced the quote of the number of legal cases that were going, if those bylaws had been overturned, construction of the plant would have been undertaken, and the government at that point would have been in negotiations that would have cost a lot more than sitting down at the beginning of the process. Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter was that TCE was going to pursue every avenue in order to start construction on that plant, and the prudent course, which has been uh, confirmed by numerous witnesses in front of the committee, was for us to sit down and negotiate, Mr. Speaker. We took the prudent course. We looked at uh, what was going to be happening with the bylaws at Oakville, and as I say, had they been overturned, construction would have begun. Thank you. New question. The member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, May is Asian Heritage Month. This month, we acknowledge the long and rich history of Asian Canadians and their contributions to Canada. It also provides an opportunity for Canadians across the country to reflect on and celebrate the contributions of Canadians of Asian heritage to the growth and prosperity of Canada. This month is important because Canada's cultural diversity strengthens the country socially, politically and economically in innumerable ways. My riding of Scarborough Rouge River is the home of many Asians, coming from all across the continent for numerous reasons. I'm proud to represent each and every one of them. During this month, there are many local events to mark Asian Heritage Month. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can he please Question. update us on the ways our government is highlighting Asian Heritage Month here in Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Tourism, Thank Culture you, and Sport. Thank you, Speaker, for the question. I want to thank the member from Scarborough Rules River for asking. Speaker, last week I had the pleasure to meet the wise governor of Jiangsu province from China and discuss with him the screening of a Chinese film showcase at this year's Toronto International Film Festival. It will feature 80 films tracing the connection between the cinemas of mainland China, Hong Kong and Taiwan. It also speaks to the significant investment our government has made to the film industry, which contributes 2.5 billion annually to our economy. Speaker, since 2003, we have invested over 81 million to support screen-based <coughs> industry, including more than 58 million in funding to TIFF. Answer. Our government is proud of this investment and the cultural film that celebrate Asian heritage and support Ontario screen-based industry. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is interesting to hear of these initiatives from the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport regarding the ways our government is highlighting Asian Heritage Month. 
It is important to recognize that our connection to Asia should not be limited to the events during this special month only. Asia is quickly becoming the world's economic engine, and more and more of our province's trade and immigration comes from countries such as Vietnam, Philippines, and China. Ontario's re relationship with China is of particular interest to my constituents. Many of them enjoy hearing about our government's partnership with China on new economic ties. Speaker, could the minister please update the House on the status of Ontario's relationship with China? Thank you, Minister. Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Minister of Governmental Affairs. Uh, Ontario and China have for many years enjoyed a close friendship and growing economic relationship. China is our second largest trading partner in the world, and two-way trade between Ontario and China stands at nearly $30 billion a year, and our exports to China have increased by 233 per cent since 2003. We've also had significant cultural connection with nearly 650,000 Chinese Canadians calling Ontario home. Speaker, to build on these ties, uh, just as one example, Ontario has been working very closely with the Chinese province of Jiangsu, our sister province in China. And last week, I too had the privilege of meeting a delegation from Jiangsu province that included the vice governor, uh, Mr. Fan Jilong. This visit and the Ontario visit to China earlier this year have strengthened our friendship and improved business collaboration in key sectors such as technology, clean technology, agriculture, science, Answer. and research. Speaker, and we look forward to that continued friendship and more, more trade. Question, the member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Finance Minister. The cost of your gas plant cancellations, Finance Minister, were listed in public accounts at close to $200 million. Yet the very real possibility of a $900 million price tag passed on to all Ontarians were nowhere to be found in the estimates. Someone in the government, God love them, had the foresight to realize that this could cost $900 million. Leading energy experts testifying before the Justice Committee under oath, along with the documents reluctantly handed over, confirmed that number too, which raises a very important but simple question for the Finance Minister. Is there a public budget and a secret budget? And if so, was the secret budget deal made available to the leader of the third party when she decided to prop up your scandal-plagued government? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the answer is no. And, uh, and, and, to the, and to the member opposite, you've just clarified your answer by saying it was a provision, it was an estimate, it was appropriate to look at the worst-case scenario, negotiations were had, resolutions were made, and public accounts was accounted for. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you. Well, actually, Minister, it wasn't in the estimates. That's what I said, and you haven't clarified a thing, actually. On Thursday in Justice Committee, Mr. Speaker, I asked the Finance Minister where did the money come from with respect to the cancellations of the Oakville and Mississauga gas plants. His response, and I quote, oh, it probably came from our contingency funds. The Premier of this province called this gas plant scandal a political decision. I don't think the people of Ontario had a seat saver program in mind when the contingency fund was implemented. What the minister is telling us is that he has no problem pulling money from a contingency fund that exists in cases of unforeseen emergencies and natural disasters and using it to hide, uh, hide line items for its own sordid political scandals. Wow. He has no problem using that fund, even if it means hiding $900 million from the people of Ontario for as long as possible in order to save his own seat. Question. Your government talks a good game about being open and transparent. Can you tell us why you hid this scandal in your Thank you. contingency fund? Mr. So, Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, the PCs are presented uh, and they're deliberately misleading documents from the Ministry of Finance. I'd ask the uh, Minister to withdraw. I withdraw. So, Mr. Here. Speaker, they've presented information that inappropriately reflects what's going on. Projected <laughs> costs from the Ministry of Finance are part of a due diligence process which officials plan for a worst-case scenario. The figures discussed by the opposition are several years old and, and are related to an assessment of potential liabilities, not projected costs. And while a complete cancellation of the plans as promised by the Conservatives and their candidates in Mississauga, 
may have also resulted in these liabilities becoming a reality. So successful negotiations by the government to relocate these plans ensured Answer. that these potential liabilities did not come to fruition. Citing these figures from the Ministry of Finance of risk assessment several years past, Mr. Speaker, Thank is you. unconstructive. Thank you. Thank you. Member from Brandon Lee Gormal. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, just a few, few weeks ago, this government finally committed to our NDP proposal to reduce auto insurance rates by 15 percent. But recently, I've heard from a number of people that they're seeing their insurance premiums increase by 15 to 20 percent upon renewal. Now, these are people with absolutely clean records and no claims whatsoever. Now, why would this government, through fiscal, allow insurance companies to increase premiums for people across Ontario when we know that a 15 percent reduction should be implemented? God bless. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, first of all, let me say that I'm very pleased that we were able to work with the NDP on this proposal. We were committed to, uh, to reducing premiums for auto insurance, Mr. Speaker. It's something that over a year ago I talked about in my own riding. It's something that we are working on, and we're doing it in a way that I think will be prudent. But, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite has highlighted why it's so important that we get the budget passed, order. Mr. Speaker, because we, in order to be able to implement the budget, it needs to be able to pass through the process in this legislature, Mr. Speaker. So I appreciate the concern from the uh, member opposite, but we really do need to get on with getting the budget passed so we can implement it, Mr. Speaker. Your supplementary. Watching them. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Premier, people in my community and across Ontario are paying some of the highest premiums in Canada. These are tough times. Families are struggling to make ends meet. This government said that they will take our NDP proposal to reduce auto insurance rates by 15 percent to make life more affordable. But how many times will this government allow insurance companies to increase premiums before they actually implement that 15 percent reduction? Finance. Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, um, and I appreciate the, the work being done by uh, the member opposite in facilitating us to get this passed so that we can work towards reducing auto insurance rates for the benefit of all Ontarians. And it should be noted that in the recent year, actually, <clears throat> auto insurance has been reduced by 0.3 percent as a result of the efforts we've done with the anti-task force, and we'll continue to do so. And it's important that we have FISCO, who is reviewing all of the submissions that are member being made today Hamilton, to avoid the very issue that the member opposite has cited. We will work together. Let's get this budget passed. Let's move on this quickly. Thank you, new, Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from Vaughan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Research and Innovation. Our government recognizes that Ontario's capacity to compete in the global economy depends on how well we can harness our research strengths, our ability to encourage innovation, and support and the support we provide our entrepreneurs. Our government's budget reiterates our commitment to research, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Our commitments, Mr. Speaker, are strong. We have invested $50 million in the Ontario Venture Capital Fund to help support startup companies. We have committed $100 million to the Ontario Brain Institute, which will help make discoveries that tackle brain disease possible. And we will invest $295 million in the youth job strategy to encourage entrepreneurship amongst our youth. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Research and Innovation, what other programs has the government invested Question. in to support entrepreneurship and innovation in our province? Minister of Research and Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member from Vaughan for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government has a strong track record for supporting entrepreneurship and innovation in this province. We have invested in three networks that have served entrepreneurs and the small and the medium-sized enterprises. These networks include the Ontario Network of Excellence, which supports the success of entrepreneurs, the Ontario Network of Small Business Enterprise Centres, which, uh, which works with municipal governments to accelerate startups and grow local economies, and the Business Advisory Services, Mr. Speaker, that helps entrepreneurs, their businesses to grow both at home and abroad. Mr. Speaker, I am proud the investments our government has made to support entrepreneurship and innovation in order to grow our economy and Answer. create jobs. Thank you. Supplementary. thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister of Research and Innovation for the outstanding job that he's doing on behalf of all Ontarians. 
Speaker, I am, I am glad to hear that our government is investing in services and programs to assist our entrepreneurs. As you know, Speaker, entrepreneurs have the potential to bring Ontario's most promising ideas and research to the market. Through research, innovation and entrepreneurship, we can find the answers to our questions, generate economic growth and create jobs. Given the challenges in the global economy, Mr. Speaker, it is more important than ever that we take action that helps turn great ideas into thriving companies and new jobs. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, what is the government doing to ensure that entrepreneurs are getting the support they need and that the programs are easily accessible? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank again the member from Guam for that question. Entrepreneurship and innovation, Mr. Speaker, are at the heart of our efforts to create jobs and grow our economy. We want to help more Ontarians to start up businesses and help their businesses prosper. In order to ensure that entrepreneurs are able to access resources quickly, we have unified these three networks, Mr. Speaker, into the Ontario Entre Network of Entrepreneurs. Through the Ontario Network of Entrepreneurs, we will be able to provide better services to Ontarians by an interactive uh, portal, uh, onebusiness.ca, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, through this initiative, Ontario entrepreneurs Answer. will be able to uh, find most appropriate sources of support to help them to grow their businesses and also help our economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, no question. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. My question this morning is uh, for the Premier. Premier, for Premier, for the past 10 years, your Liberal government has failed Northern Ontario. Yep. With an 11.3% unemployment rate, North Bay, like much of Northern Ontario, is in crisis. Wow. One industry that is managing to succeed is contact call centres. On page 262 of the recent McGuinty Win Horvath budget, you announced the elimination of the apprenticeship training tax credit for only is. contact centres. How can Northern Ontario residents have any confidence in your government when you are planning to kill up to 8,000 important jobs what? in Northern Ontario with a single oh, decision? So. Sir Finance. I appreciate the question. And I appreciate the concerns. I know in the budget in 2012, we announced the effectiveness of the uh, apprenticeship training tax credits and promoting it to provide for those apprentices to have full completion when they're working, to provide for full-time employment. The intent, of course, is to help people have jobs and maintain those jobs. What we're finding, though, is the eligibility requirements through the call centers has not resulted in completion of the apprenticeship program or uh, the full-time employment as expected. It's actually averaging only 10 percent. And frankly, I think we all agree in this House what we want to do is provide our stimulus and investments to help those individuals have full-time employment for a long period of time. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Northern Ontario has a jobs crisis, but yeah. so does London and southwestern Ontario. For the second straight month, London has the highest big city unemployment rate in Canada, and shamefully, Windsor is right there too. 11.3% unemployment in North Bay, 10% in London, and 9.2% in Windsor. Premier, Ontario has 600,000 unemployed men and women. Your budget does nothing to help grow our economy and create jobs. In fact, for the 25,000 people province-wide working in the contact calling industry, you have put their jobs at risk. Premier, the PC party and our leader, Tim Hudak, have unveiled a firm vision to get Ontario back on track. Which of the items outlined does your coalition government plan to implement? Thank you. Mr. Minister of Economic Development and Trade and Employment. Mr. Economic Development, Trade well, and thank Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to take the supplementary on this because, uh, well, it was interesting. Just a couple of months ago in Barrie, there was an announcement. I think the Barrie mayor said it was one of the best days that he had had as mayor, where they created 500 new jobs in a call centre that opened up there. I know they're also looking at Guelph as a possible additional area to expand. But I want to talk about London, the London area specifically, because I know that the I know that the member opposite is member specifically interested in, in the London area. Minister. Minister. The member from Lambton, Kent Middlesex, asked the question. I'm sure he wants to hear the answer, and he'll uh, ask. The member from Minister Account. The member from Lambton, Kent Middlesex, is warned. Carry on, please. So. Uh, 
as part of the over 400,000 jobs that we've created since the start of this recession. I was in London and the London area. In fact, I was in the member opposite's own riding on Thursday, where I was Thank announcing you. the government's $300,000 support you. to Armo. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontarians recently learned that during the Easter weekend, Mr. Joseph Cummins, an 80-year-old patient at London Health Sciences Centre, was told to clean his own toilet. Ooh. This government insists that frontline staff cuts and hospital underfunding won't affect care. Is letting people fend for themselves what the minister has in mind uh, when she talks about transformation in health care? Wow. Minister, minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, speaker, Ontarians, um, Ontarians have the right to expect the highest quality care, no matter where they get care in this province. Speaker. We are undertaking a tremendous transformation in our health care sector right now, Speaker, and we are seeing the results of focusing on the community sector. We're also really focusing on improving the quality of care in our hospitals. In fact, the unanimous passage of the Excellent Care for All Act celebrates and put us on the right path to continue to get better value by improving the quality of care in our health care sectors. So now, Speaker, hospitals across the province are publicly reporting on quality indicators, and we are seeing quality improvements. We've got, uh, we're on the right path. Answer. We have more to do, for sure, Speaker, but I will never stop to continue to improve quality in our hospitals. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the minister says that, that people have the right to expect high-quality care. They're obviously not getting it. I guess they only have the right to expect it, but not to actually get it, Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Cummins happens to be a retired professor of genetics from Western University. But with the real threat of hospital-acquired infections, it doesn't take an expert to tell us that patients shouldn't be cleaning their own toilets. Mm, wow. London Health Sciences is planning to lay off an additional 60 staff, even as this government lets hospital CEO salaries skyrocket. Wow. Can the minister assure the people of London that sick patients won't be cleaning their own toilets, or worse, as a result of her cuts in the hospital wow. sector? Wow. Well, uh, uh, just to be clear, Speaker, um, as I, as I said, was saying earlier, and I've said many times in this House, there is a very important transformation going on in our health care sector. So while well, hospital budget, the base budgets are being kept to zero, Speaker, we are heavily investing in the community sector. The Premier was in London on Friday, Speaker. We actually visited a family that uh, exemplified the transformation that is underway. Because of our investment in the community sector, and thanks to the Home First uh, uh, philosophy that was being applied, uh, Peggy and Norm were able to be in their own home, where they want to be, comfortable in their community, Speaker, instead of in hospital, instead of in long-term care, which is where they would have been had these investments not been made. Answer. So that transformation is underway. I acknowledge hospitals are dealing with challenging uh, uh, decisions, Speaker, Thank but you. there is no question the system is stronger. Thank you. New question. Member from Niagara Falls. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Premier in her role as the Minister of Agriculture and Foods. Minister, this Sunday was a significant day in my riding of Niagara Falls, Niagara Lake, and particularly Fort Erie. The Fort Erie racetrack opened for the 116th time in the season of 2013. I was there. I saw the largest ever crowd for an opening day of a Fort Erie racetrack. It was an exciting time. Each year, Mr. Speaker, thousands of families come to the track to enjoy the festivities, the excitement that racing provides. I know firsthand our government has been working with the Horse Racing Transition Panel to build a strong, sustainable horse racing Member industry. from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come to order. Member from the Minister of Rural Affairs, come to order. I along with my constituents and that we are interested in making sure it remains healthy and strong Question. for years to come. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Premier, in her role as the Minister of Agriculture and Food, 
Could the minister please provide an update on what our government is doing to support Thank the you. horse racing industry? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Agriculture and Food. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Niagara Falls. I sincerely want to thank the member from Niagara Falls for his support and advocacy on this file, Mr. Speaker. He has been terrific. And as you know, Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to a, a sustainable and long future for Ontario's horse racing industry. We know how important the industry is to communities like Niagara Falls, but across Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, I've asked the transition panel to develop a long-term plan to implement recommendations from its report. And by that, Mr. Speaker, I mean the integration of horse racing with the OLG strategy and the modernization. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek will come to order. And while I'm at it, the, the member from Kawartha Lakes. Carry on. And by that, Mr. Speaker, I mean that the Ministry of Finance and OLG will work with stakeholders to work on the integration of horse racing within the modernization strategy. And I heard a voice from the other side saying, details, Mr. Speaker. Answer. That's the point. The point is that that integration strategy needs to be worked out, and that's what I've asked the panel thank to work you. on, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, thank you for your response, Minister. I'm glad to hear our government is committed to building a strong and sustainable horse racing industry. I want to share with you that when I met with a transition panel that was made up of three significant former members of parliament from each of the three parties, I sat with them and they explained to me that the slots at the racetrack, they clearly said it was unaccountable, that it was not transparent and it lacked a proper focus on customers. Their long-term plan will be very important to look to the transition to the industry to integrate horse racing with the modernization of Ontario's gaming strategy. I'm thrilled that racing resumed this week in Fort Erie. So are the workers, so are the fans who came out. I know there are many other tracks in Ontario that have begun racing for 2013. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Premier in her role as the Minister of Agriculture and Food, could the Minister please provide an update on the status of racing across tracks in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Rural Affairs. Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Niagara Falls for his excellent question. Mr. Speaker, our government is actively working to ensure horse racing is sustainable and successful. Absolutely. Right now, the most important thing for Ontarians could do is support this important industry and come out to the tracks on the racing date. This week, there is racing at nine tracks across the province of Ontario. I was in attendance at Quartha Downs for the opening of the 2013 season, and it was an excellent evening with a record crowd on Saturday, May 18th. I must say, Mr. Speaker, I made an investment, very little return, but that's okay. I encourage all members to visit their local track and to support this vibrant industry in rural Ontario. Thank you. Your question? From Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my questions for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, this weekend a guard at the Elgin Middlesex Dissension Centre was sent to hospital after he was attacked by an inmate. This represents just one more instance of violence that has been all too common at EMDC on your watch. I met with you last August and you told me that your staff was working on implementing a 12-point action plan intended to mitigate the problems at EMDC. Since that time, overcrowding remains an issue. Weekend lockdowns are regular, a fire broke out, and a near riot occurred. Reports indicate that you've been slow to implement your promised changes. Minister, will a guard have to die before you take decisive action on EMDC? Minister of Community and Social Services and Responsible Corrections. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, and I thank the member uh, from the opposition about his advocacy to improve the situation in uh, the uh, EMDC. I, it's unfortunate when incidents like this uh, happen. I'm uh, not uh, going to comment because there is a police investigation going on as we speak. But uh, as uh, I told uh, him in the past, and I invited him also to a briefing on uh, what we are doing to improve the situation in uh, EMDC. Uh, the ministry official continue to work uh, with staff. I tried one way. Uh, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. 
So, uh, Mr. Speaker, as I said, the ministry officials continue to work with staff and their union to address their concern through our action plan. The plan focuses on improving supervision and compliance with policy. These policies have been developed by correction experts, and we are investing Answer. in 350 cameras at EMDC to better supervise and intervene when necessary. And with the supplement, I will continue to say what we are doing Here. to improve the situation there. Supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Minister, a camera cannot intervene when they're beating up a guard. Minister, the guards have their backs up against the walls and, and things continue to devolve. A broken metal from a light fixture that can be sharpened into a shank has not yet been totally recovered since the last near ride at the jail. And I've been informed that the ministry has bought metal detectors, that, but they sit idle because they haven't provided any training on the staff on how to use them. Absolutely. This is just one of the many examples that are going on with this gross mismanagement. Minister, any number of violent occurrences in the past year should have been a wake-up call for you, yet you're remaining asleep at the switch. Your inaction is putting guard safety in jeopardy and lives at risk. Please, let's work together and stop a death from occurring at this jail. Please. You see it, please. I'll finish my sentence. The member from here on Bruce, the member was asking the question from your own caucus. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, health and safety of the correctional officer in our correctional facility, it's my utmost importance. And I've been working very hard to make sure that it, it, it does uh, improve. And yes, there is, you know, entering in these facilities, there is drugs entering to facilities, there is, uh, you know, other uh, tools that should not enter into facilities. So we are, as we speak, reviewing the process, reviewing, you know, who is doing and who is not doing their work there. That, that's why, you know, these, uh, these uh, situations occur, and we'll continue to uh, to make sure that the 12 point plan is implemented but you know the work cannot be done at all time you know 7 days a week 24 hours a day so it takes longer but Answer. we are determined that we will move forward we have changed you know the the uh, direction the leadership there and we will have uh, we will implement a board of director at this facility Excellent. to make sure thank that you. you know things are improving thank you thank you thank the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today's launch of Bike Month in cities like Toronto, and it's a good day to remember that 600,000 people in Ontario bike every day. According to a new survey from Share the Road, the vast majority of people in Ontario think that the provincial government should be investing more in bike lanes and cycling infrastructure. Quebec has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in provincial bike networks, but Ontario's motto on cycling seems to be, go slow. Why are Ontarians still waiting for a new provincial bicycling strategy more than three years after you, as Minister of Transportation, promised a new strategy? Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the member for his very sincere question. Uh, these things are tied together. The cycling strategy is in its final stages of development. We'll be making announcements very, very shortly. Uh, I don't want it to be lost on people, Mr. Speaker, that the big move in the investment strategy that Metrolinx released today uh, is one of the, fact of the funding mechanisms for a cycling strategy. Uh, we do not see uh, the issues of transit, automobiles, trucks, or bicycles or pedestrians as separate parts. We see it as an integrated approach, and we are setting money aside uh, for integrating that transit, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I was recently uh, at the Mount Joy uh, GO station, where, as part of GO, we are promoting cycling as the connection Answer. between GO trains and residents uh, in those areas, Mr. Speaker. So transit con cycling continues to be an integrated part of our overall transit. Thank you. Strategy. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'll send my message back to the Premier. Speaker, the Liberal government has had 10 years now to make cycling a priority. In 2010, the government's draft bike strategy promised funding for municipal bike infrastructure. Now, the government's backpedaled and it's removed this from the strategy. 
The government has rejected calls to invest a mere one percent of its highway budget in bike lanes, and this government has now allowed Toronto to remove bike lanes on Jarvis without the environmental assessment that we asked for. And now this government has opposed simple measures to update the Highway Traffic Act so that streets are safe for all users. Speaker, when will this government finally make Ontario a leader rather than a laggard when it comes to cycling? Thank you, Minister. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. The, we are paving shoulders now on secondary highways. I am a cyclist, as we are a two-bicycle, no-car household, Mr. Speaker, and I cycle across Ontario to, from Toronto to Montreal most summers uh, doing fundraisers. We are developing on the provincial portion a very sophisticated, well-put-together uh, cycling, uh, cycling infrastructure, and the cycling strategy, along with the big move, will address that. The other issues that the honourable member raised, Mr. Speaker, are decisions of a municipal nature. We, we are not involved in discussions around uh, whether Ottawa or Cornwall or Toronto allocate cycling lanes. Those are municipal. Most municipalities have their own cycling strategies, Mr. Speaker, and their own cycling Sir? capacities. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. I've got, uh, I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. Um, a lot of skilled tradespeople in my riding of Oakville are quite pleased with the way things are going with apprenticeship ratios these days and the progress that's being made. The College of Trades is a vital tool in promoting the importance of skilled trades. Now, Our government recognizes that Ontario's apprenticeship system is, is a key part of building the well-educated and the highly skilled workforce that this province needs to compete in the current and future economy. At the same time, we all hear about the shortage of skilled workers in our economy, but we believe the skilled trades are a tremendous career option for young people, and I still encourage many people in my riding in Oakville to pursue a career in the skilled trades. As such, Speaker, through you to the Minister, sure. I ask if he is aware of actions being taken currently to promote skilled trade opportunities for young people in Ontario. Thank you, Minister of Training, College, University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pleased to respond to that very good question. The College of Trades is mandated to promote the skilled trades to our young people, and I'm looking forward to seeing those efforts uh, as they move forward in that area. A number of government programs and incentives are geared to promoting the skilled trades and apprenticeships as well. But I'd really like to share with the House an exciting initiative that was recently visited by our Premier, the Ontario Technological Skills Competition, which was held in Kitchener. I want to thank Gail Smith, uh, Executive Director of Skills Canada Ontario, her team and her team for organizing this annual competition that engaged close to 2,000 young skilled trade competitors, as well as tens of thousands of other young people. This competition provides young people with exposure to the skilled trades. I want to thank and recognize Gail Smith and her team for their incredible passion, commitment and contribution to opening up the skilled trades to our young yes, people sir. through this event. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.